In today's lesson, we're going to learn about momentum. Now, memes aside, sports provide us with plenty of great opportunities to learn about momentum. Oftentimes, we hear the announcers talking about momentum has shifted or that the momentum has changed. In addition, we see momentum in action at all times. Keep in mind that the announcer never says that momentum is lost or that momentum is destroyed. That's a key point and we'll touch base on that later. The definition of momentum is a product of an object's mass and its velocity. Remember that mass is a scalar quantity, which means it only has magnitude or numerical value and units only. Velocity, on the other hand, is a vector quantity. It has magnitude, units, and also includes direction. Momentum is a vector quantity because of velocity. And as a result, it can have a positive or negative numerical values to indicate direction. Momentum's variable is not m. Remember that variables are the letters that you see in equations. m is a variable for mass, and the unit for mass is kg for kilograms. In our formula sheet, momentum is equation number 17. It is p is equal to m times v. Now p stands for momentum. It's a lowercase p, not an uppercase p. We'll come to that at another time. So p is momentum, and the units for momentum is kilograms times meters per second. The reason for this is because it's mass times velocity. Remember that the variable m stands for mass, and the units for mass is kilograms. And the letter v stands for velocity, and the units for velocity is meters per second. So when in the equation we multiply mass times velocity, we take their units of kilograms times meters per second and get the units for momentum. Here's another way to see it happening. Again, momentum, the variable for that is a lowercase p, mass is represented by m, and velocity is represented by v. The units of each is in the bottom line. We can learn about momentum from sports. We can also learn about forces, Newton's laws. Here's a great example to tie into Newton's third law, as well as how momentum ties into football. Whether it's a lineman stuffing a running back or a safety colliding with a wide receiver, all NFL defenders have a single-minded goal, to stop the ball carrier. The object of making the tackle is you want to get the guy down and limit the amount of yards he's able to gain, especially after contact. When a tackle is performed correctly, it's not just a thing of defensive beauty. It's also an elegant depiction of Newton's third law of motion sometimes called the action-reaction law. Newton's third law says that each action or force has an equal and opposite reaction. So if I were to push against the body, that body is going to push back against me with an equal and opposite force. An important part of Newton's third law is the concept of momentum, which in football is the mass of a player multiplied by his velocity, represented by the formula P equals mv. NFL players may not know the formula, but they're keenly aware of the role momentum plays in tackling. It's very important to have, have some speed and momentum as you're going in to make that tackle. The better if you're able to use that to your advantage, the better you're able to make contact and get a guy down right away. Some key points about momentum. If an object is not moving, which means it's at rest or velocity is equal to zero meters per second, then there is no momentum. At that point, P is equal to zero kg times meters per second. In order to increase momentum, you can increase an object's mass or its velocity, or both. You can also increase momentum by decreasing time. Now you may be wondering, what does time have to do in all of this? Think of it this way. The less time that it takes to cover the same amount of distance means that there was an increase in velocity. Let's think of a football player running downfield. 
if they ran 50 yards in 10 seconds first time around compared to running the same 50 yards in only eight seconds the second time around, that means that they increase their velocity the second time around. By reducing the time that it takes to cover a certain amount of distance, you have now increased velocity. And by increasing velocity, you have increased momentum. Just remember though, it's not just about velocity or mass, it's about the product of both of those variables. Let's take a look at these two examples. We have a bullet and we have an elephant. Which one has more momentum? Well, we really can't tell unless we know information. Unfortunately though, when it comes to assessments, most students either tend to pick the more massive object or they tend to pick the, the object that has a greater numerical value for velocity. The truth is, you really don't know. So here's some more information. The mass of the bullet is 0 0.045 kilograms. The velocity of the bullet is 3,000 meters per second. Mass of an elephant is 1,250 kilograms. The velocity of that elephant is 0 0.108 meters per second. As we use our formula of P is equal to MV, or momentum is equal to mass times velocity, the momentum of the bullet with a mass of 0 0.045 times a velocity of 3,000 meters per second comes out to 135 kilograms times meters per second. The momentum of the elephant with a mass of 1,250 kilograms with a velocity of 0 0.108 meters per second comes out to 135 kilograms per meters per second as well. So the momentum of these objects is equal. What is another scenario in which these two can have the same momentum? As we discussed earlier, they can have the same momentum when they are both at rest, which means that the velocity is equal to zero meters per second. If velocity is at zero meters per second or an object is not moving, then momentum is also equal to zero. Now it's your turn. Compare the two objects and decide which of these two has a greater momentum. You should pause this video before moving forward. Now that you've finished the calculations, let's see if you were right. P cyclist, or the momentum of the cyclist, with a mass of 85 kilograms times a velocity of 16 meters per second, came out to 1,360 kilograms per meters per second. The momentum of the truck, with a mass of 1,000 times a velocity of 0.8 meters per second, was only 800 kilograms times meters per second. Therefore, in this case, the cyclist has the greater momentum, with a little asterisk. And the asterisk says, results may vary, kind of like those supplement industries that you see with every advertisement, and says your results may vary. Well, the truth is, your results will always vary. So you should always calculate in order to make sure you have the right answer. Here are some variations of problems that you'll see with momentum. You should pause the video and solve these problems. Now that you've solved these problems, let's see if you get the correct answers. Problem number one, a 20 kilogram boy is running at a speed of four meters per second and it has a momentum of what? So the question is asking for us to find P or momentum. That's our unknown. The mass is 20 kilograms and the velocity is four meters per second. Our equation is P is equal to MV. From there, we go ahead and substitute our values. Our mass was 20 and our velocity was four. We multiplied it at two and the momentum for the boy is 80 kilograms times meters per second. Problem number two, a 64 kilogram woman has a momentum of 448 kilograms per meters per second. What is her speed? In this case, we're looking for her velocity. Her mass is 64 kilograms and her momentum is 448 kilograms times meters per second. Again, we're still using the same equation of P equals MV, and now we substitute our values. Since we have the value of momentum, we're gonna go ahead and replace P with 448 this time. 
our mass was 64 and we're solving for velocity. So 448 is equal to 64V. In order to isolate and solve for V, we have to divide by 64. We do this on both sides and the velocity is equal to seven meters per second. Finally, number three, what speed would the woman need to have in order to have the same momentum as a boy? Now you're thinking we've already solved for the speed of the woman, but the question is asking, what is the speed that the woman should have now in order to have the same momentum as the boy that we had in problem earlier? Remember that the boy had a momentum of 80 kilograms times meters per second. So again, we're now solving for the velocity of the woman. We have her mass at 64 kilograms. The momentum of the boy was 80 kilograms as meters per second. And we want the woman to have the same momentum. Therefore, we're using 80 kilograms times meters per second instead of her momentum in problem number two. We go back to the same formula of P equals MB. In this case, the momentum is 80 and the mass of the woman is still 64 times her velocity, which we're solving for. Remember to divide by 64 and divide on both sides. On the right-hand side, it cancels out, and 80 divided by 64 gives us a velocity of 1.25 meters per second. The variables of m and v are both directly proportionate to p. That means that if m was to increase, p would also increase. Or if v was to increase, p would also increase. If, however, p was to always remain the same, let's just say that the hypothetical value of 100 and mass was 25 and our velocity was 4, that would give us the momentum of 100. So if p was to remain the same, in that case, mass and velocity would be inversely proportional to each other, meaning that in order to keep p constant, if m went up, v would go down. And if velocity went up, mass would have to go down in order to achieve the same momentum. This is a little confusing. Let's go ahead and watch the video. All right, one on one, big guy versus the smaller guy. Who's going to come out on top? <laughs> Me, obviously. Whatever, I take down guys twice your size all the time. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, according to the physics of tackling, we have to look at more than just who's bigger than who. Momentum plays a huge role. Sir Isaac Newton called momentum the quantity of motion, and it's the product of an object's mass and velocity. Here, the running back has more mass, but the defensive back more than makes up for it with his greater velocity. As a result, their combined momentum is in the direction of the defensive player, and the collision moves the runner back. Now, it's also possible that when the mass and velocities of the two objects are multiplied, that they're exactly equal, but in opposite directions. In this case, the momentums completely cancel each other out, and the result is a top. All right, so let's look at some examples. If moving at the same velocity, the object with a greater mass has a greater momentum. In this case, if we're looking at that cyber truck versus a sports car, and they're both moving at the same velocity, the Cybertruck would have a greater momentum because of its greater mass. If two objects have the same mass, the object with the greater velocity has a greater momentum. In the bottom scenario, we're gonna assume that it's two identical trains, therefore they have the same exact mass. Whoever is moving at the greater velocity will have the greater momentum. As we just saw in the previous video, there's one of two ways of having the same momentum. If an object has a lot less mass, it can make up for it with a greater amount of velocity in order to have the same amount of momentum as an object with a greater amount of mass with a lot less velocity. Let's move on to some important vocabulary. Keep in mind that these are very simplified definitions. You've heard of conserve and conservation. This simply means to save or to protect. When it comes to physics and here the law of conservation of momentum, it means that the numerical value of the momentum remains the same and constant, 
before and after a collision. This means that the momentum is saved. We also have delta, that little triangle. That means the change in. So when you see the triangle P, that means the change in momentum. And we're also gonna go ahead and talk about impulse. Impulse is the amount of force applied or experienced over an amount of time. The impulse that an object experiences is equal to the change in momentum over a time interval. Now, I know this might be a little too much, so let's go ahead and finish off with the original video and see what all these mean. An important part of Newton's third law is the concept of momentum, which in football is the mass of a player multiplied by his velocity, represented by the formula P equals MV. NFL players may not know the formula, but they're keenly aware of the role momentum plays in tackling. It's very important to have, have some speed and momentum as you're going in to make that tackle. The better if you're able to use that to your advantage, the better you're able to make contact and get a guy down right away. In every collision on the football field, Newton's third law dictates that the total momentum between players must be the same before the collision as it is after the collision. This relationship is referred to as conservation of momentum. The law of conservation momentum says that the P, the momentum before the collision, is equal to P, the momentum after the collision. This law, represented by the formula P before equals P after, can be illustrated with a simple toy called a Newton's cradle. In this case, we have displaced an initial sphere, and when we let it go, it has some momentum. It's mass times velocity. Um, when it impacts the next sphere, that momentum is transferred to the middle three spheres and then passed on to the final sphere. And so because it has the same mass, it will move away with the same velocity that the first sphere impacted the middle three spheres. The interaction of balls on a Newton's cradle can help illustrate what's known as an elastic collision, defined as one in which there is no loss of kinetic energy in the form of heat, sound waves, or deformation of the object. On the football field, collisions are typically inelastic collisions because kinetic energy is released mostly in the form of compression between the player's bodies and sound waves. Inelastic collisions are the rule of the day. We see them all the time in football. That is the energy of motion of two runners. After they collide, that energy is dissipated in performing their bodies. That's like a spring. So some of your energy of motion went into that compression. You might have heard a loud snap from our pad. Some of the energy of our collision was transferred to the energy in the air that you hear. While big hits look and sound spectacular, what's most important in tackling is stopping the ball carrier's forward progress. If your pads are underneath his and you're hitting on an upward slope, you direct the energy up and you take him back. At the point of contact, hopefully that's where the ball stops play in. Whether a tackle is successful or not, we can be certain that the same force is exerted on both players and the total momentum before and after the collision is the same. For that, we have Newton's third law to thank. All right, so now that we've listened to and watched that video, we can go ahead and talk about a few more equations and a few more terminology. Equation number 18 is the law of conservation of momentum. And that is dictated as PI is equal to PF, which basically means that P initial is equal to P final, or P before is equal to P after. Again, remember that the P is a lowercase p for momentum. Equation number 19 is impulse. The variable for impulse is J. And the equation for number 19 confu confuses a lot of students because it's quite rather long, but you could use either part of it. J is equal to F times T, which is also equal to delta P, which is our change in momentum, which is also equal to mass times final velocity minus initial velocity. You don't have to use all of these. You only use the part that you need or that you have. In the video, they also mentioned elastic collisions versus inelastic collisions. 
Elastic collision is one that there's no loss of kinetic, which is moving energy, in the form of heat, sound waves, damage, or deformation. A couple of examples are pool balls, exercise balls, Newton's cradle, and even bumper cars. Technically because they don't get damaged. Yes, you hear sound in all of these, however, it's negligible. The key takeaway is that there is still momentum is conserved. In an inelastic collision, kinetic energy is not conserved. There is loss of kinetic energy because of damage, sound waves, and so on. Most of your collisions are inelastic collisions, football tackles, car crashes, and so on. The key thing here is that we still conserve momentum. So momentum is conserved in both elastic and inelastic collisions. The law of conservation of momentum states that the total momentum before and after a collision is always equal to each other. Finally, moving on to equation number 19, impulse. This is the longest equation, not because it involves the many things, but because there's so many parts that are equal to each other. The variable for impulse is J. Again, that's the letter that you see in the equation. The unit for impulse is Newton's times seconds. This is because if you remember the definition, it's the amount of force applied or experienced over a certain amount of time. Of course, F stands for force and the units for force is in Newtons. Little t stands for time and the unit for time is in seconds. So if it's F times T, the units get multiplied and that's how you get the units of Newtons times seconds for impulse or, j or the variable J. Impulse is also equal to the change in momentum. So delta P is the change in momentum. Remember that momentum is mass times velocity. So we have kg times meters per second as the units for delta P. Again, the letter M stands for mass. The unit for mass is kilograms. And finally, we have VF and VI, which stand for final initial velocity respectively and the unit for velocity is in meters per second. It's important to make sure that you subtract correctly and that you subtract initial velocity from final velocity. So it's VF minus VI, not the other way around. So this was just the tip of the iceberg. The following topics and the related problems require additional and separate lectures. These include the law of conservation of momentum, elastic versus inelastic collisions, and impulse, which is the impulse momentum theorem. So in today's lesson, we really talked about momentum, but we also had to touch base on a few of these topics. I hope you found this video helpful. Thank you and have a great day.